welcome to all of you who are tuning in. Um, if you are regular Western Front Association members who know me or people who know me from Twitter, welcome. If it's the first time you're tuning into any of my lectures, welcome too. I hope you enjoy it. And the subject I'm going to talk about this evening is one that's quite close to my heart. And it's about two quite remarkable men, Walter and William Congreve, pictured here on cigarette cards, very popular, of course, in the era. So, uh, cigarette cards of VC winners. These two men, Walter and William, would, be, would become what is up to this stage, the very last father and son VC in British military history. Their achievements were quite remarkable, but perhaps even more remarkable than their achievement is actually their life, life story. These were two remarkable men. And I think it, by exploring their lives and exploring their personalities as well, it teaches us something not just about the First World War. It also teaches us something that we perhaps are apt to forget about the nature of personalities in the First World War. And that sometimes those very stern images of generals in black and white staring out the um, long-running image, the long-running idea that the Edward and was particularly austere and was not particularly kind or loving, actually get exploded by these two men. In some ways, they're prototypical warriors, prototypical soldiers, brave, um, self-denying, courageous, um, in some cases, highly aggressive, particularly William's, uh, Billy's case. But they also teach us something about love and familial relations and how even at the highest ranks, and men who at the time were actually very famous within Britain, could also feel the anguish of loss. I think it's a very moving story. I think it's a very interesting story. And I think also it's very informative about the complexity of personality within the Great War. Remember that every single person in the Great War, every soldier, every um, civilian, is a person, has a personality. It's very easy, and indeed perhaps it's necessary for us to give blanket interpretations of what soldiers were like, or nurses were like, or civilians were like, but of course every single person was unique and individual. And so it's a real place to actually be able to dive into a unique story here. I know the story is surrounded by courage, it's also a story about father and son and everything that goes with that relationship. Now what makes William, uh, sorry, Walter and William most famous is their achievement by becoming a father and son VC. They weren't the first father and son VC, but they are, to this current date, the last father and son VC. Interestingly enough, Congreve, Walter Congreve, had contemporaries in um, VC winners who also had, whose fathers had also won the VC. On the left, uh, we can see Charles Goff and his son John Goff. Charles Goff had won the VC for several separate actions of heroism in the Indian Mutiny, or Indian uh, Rebellion, if you prefer, in 1857 to 58. And then his son John had won the Victoria Cross for actions in Somaliland with a small column rescuing a wounded officer. Similarly, Frederick Roberts had also won his VC, uh, of course, Lord Roberts later. Frederick Roberts had won his VC in India for, again, multiple actions of bravery between 1857 and 58. And then his only son, Freddie, won the Victoria Cross in the Boer War in 1899. Of course, um, the Cong uh, Walter Congreve knew quite well John Goff, and as we'll see in just a few moments, he, he knew Freddie uh, Roberts extremely well. And in fact, Walter would win his Victoria Cross alongside Freddie Roberts, in the very same action, and indeed they will be intimately connected in how they won that award. But the, remember that the Victoria Cross had only been introduced in the mid 19th century, it was still a relatively new award, and <clears throat> at this stage there had only been two, or indeed one, prior winner prior to Walter winning it. So this is a quite a remarkable achievement. It's only been achieved three times in the history of the British military, and Walter and William, as we will see, were the last. There is an air of tragedy to these father and son stories. In both these cases, the son uh, met an untimely end. John Goff killed by German shellfire in 1915, and Freddie, as we will see shortly, actually killed in the action in which he won his Victoria Cross, uh, predeceasing his father. But all that lies in the future. What about Walter Congreve? Well, the Congreves came from perhaps one of the most celebrated military families in Britain. They had a very, very long tradition in both society and the military. Their societal connections stretch back as far as the Norman Conquest. And certainly from the 1700s, from the late 1600s into the 1700s, the Congreve family had become synonymous with aspects of the British military, primarily, but not exclusively, the army. 
Many of them had served in military capacities in one form or another. And perhaps the most famous of the Congreves up to this point was Sir William Congreve, uh, pictured here in his army uniform. One uh, side point about the Congreves is their uh, maddening habit of calling all their sons William or Walter, which means it gets very, very complicated the further you get into their family tree. But William Congreve, pictured here, is most famous for the invention of the Congreve rockets during the Napoleonic Wars contemporary illustration of them here. Relatively crude weapons, but quite frightening to be fired upon uh, by them, made a tremendous whistling sound as they descended. Their very erraticness, their difficulty of aiming them, made them quite terrifying. Congreve had made an enormous amount of uh, money, an enormous amount of capital, an enormous amount of fame for the invention of these rockets. Um, he went on after the Napoleon Wars had finished to become an MP and had quite a remarkable life. He's also perhaps the only British Army officer ever to be immortalised in another nation's national anthem. And that's, of course, the American national anthem, which references the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting there. Those rockets were Congreve rockets. So he's immortalised in the American national anthem. Now, we tend to remember him because of his invention of rockets, but he'd actually led an incredibly scandalous life. He'd fathered two children and a mistress. Uh, both, evidently both illegitimate. He then married a Portuguese Catholic, again, extremely un irregular in the 1820s. And then he became involved in an enormous scandal in which he'd advanced himself a vast loan for the benefit of one of his own companies. He clearly violated all sorts of pro um, uh, legal, um, legal matters here. He was simultaneously head of a bank and head of a company. And then using his connections to the bank, he'd given his company an enormous loan. With the authorities closing in, he actually fled to France and he was tried in his absence and was found guilty of fraud. And indeed, the authorities were waiting to arrest him should he ever set foot back in Britain. He never returned. He actually died in France in 1828, a part of his Congreve history that isn't perhaps well known. And those, that eccentric personality that has both brilliance, he was certainly a fine inventor and a courageous man, uh, combined with a certain amount of devilry, clearly ran through into his illustrious descendants. The main one we're going to talk about initially is Walter Congreve between 1862 and 1927, pictured here in the uniform of the Rifle Brigade around about 1899. Congreve himself had a roguish start in life. He was academically gifted and he actually went to Oxford University in the early part of his life at Pembroke College. Something happened at the college that's still something of a matter of dispute. What we know is that he apparently wounded a member of the lecturing staff whilst he was wielding an air rifle. The exact circumstances of how this came to happen, uh, why this lecturer was shot, or why Congreve indeed was wielding a, a, a local firearm at a member of staff is unclear, but it was a disgrace and Congreve was very quickly drummed out of the college, as one might expect. Um, the exact details still somewhat of obscure. This left Congreve without an obvious route uh, for career. And so he joined the military at a relatively late age. He was already in his early 20s. That's quite late for uh, a scion of the British military here. But he joined, uh, he uh, entered through the militia, as many officers did, joining the Rifle Brigade in the early 1880s. And he had a relatively a professional yet undistinguished career up until 1899. Indeed, the most notable feature about Congreve's early career was his health. Congreve had severe asthma, likely worsened by his habit of smoking for, in, his earlier, in his earlier years, though he did abandon that as he grew older. This asthma was quite severe and he was prone to very, very debilitating attacks. He also suffered from numerous bouts of bronchitis. There was no particular cure for it, no treatment for it in the late 19th century. And so Congreve approached his problem in a way that would come to define much of his life. He regarded it as a problem that could be overcome by sheer force of will. And indeed, there's some suggestion that in his early life, he came to regard his asthma as some sort of moral failing, uh, not an entirely uncommon view in the late 19th century. And he, he always punched himself for his physical disability. He would push himself to tremendous lengths. And it, despite his, his asthma, he actually played um, high standard of football in, in India. Was known as a very tough tackling midfielder. 
He would push himself through pain. And although at times he'd be doubled up with asthma attacks and coughing, he would even refuse help and he would push himself through. And this idea that he could overcome his physical disability through sheer force of will reflects a lot about how Congi thought and fought indeed uh, as the wars would go on. Even in an army that prided itself on a certain amount of physical toughness, Congreve was considered by his contemporaries to be a true iron man. And Congreve took his uh, desire to use his, his personality and his mental strength to overcome physical disability a step further. He rejected any form of luxury. He almost lived um, a, 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 a self-denying life. And this would travel with him through his entire life. Years later, his wife commented that the, the greatest misery that Walter could experience was a meal in a high-end restaurant. He hated any aspect of luxury. And there's some suggestion when one reads his letters and papers that he regarded this as encouraging his weakness, that he could not maintain this level of mental strength if he allowed himself to luxuriate in any way, shape or form. Now, he also demanded a certain amount of this from his men and those around him. So he was a tough taskmaster. He was hard on himself and he was hard on those around him. But this, as we will see, was not entirely without merit. Now, Congreve had not had the opportunity to see any real action for almost 20 years in his military career. He was a captain in 1899, and when the Boer War broke out in the same year, he was quite eager to get to South Africa and see combat. <clears throat> He was posted to a battalion of the Rifle Brigade and headed out there, only to find that battalion had been imprisoned in Ladysmith. It had actually been uh, put into the sea, but it was in the city, or in the town, I should say, when the Boers began to lay siege to it. And so he was unable to join it. He was an officer without a battalion. And so he floated around. The relief force that was marching to, uh, to relieve Ladysmith, Reavers, Bullers, Natal Field Force, Floating around with no particular post, a junior officer, he was given the very unfancied position of press censor, not the kind of position that a fighting officer like Congreve would ever want, but this was how it was. And so he was part of Reavers Buller's headquarters staff as the army marched to Colenso, where it would fight the first battle of its particular campaign to relieve Ladysmith. <clears throat> This is a picture uh, from the British, from the British artillery lines, in fact, looking towards what we might term the Colenso position. You can see in the background uh, that enormous uh, ridge line, a cop, or really a series of cops, um, high, classified as small hills in South African terminology, but, but very high to uh, British and European eyes. The, what you can't see is that there's a valley between the British position and that, uh, that ridge line at the back, and in that valley lies the Tagela River, a slow flowing but deep river that was blocking the British advance towards Ladysmith. Ladysmith lay beyond that ridge line. The British assumed that the Boers had taken position on the ridge, on the high ground, that seemed to make sense. But in fact, the Boers had secretly and very, very carefully uh, dug themselves in, into the banks of the river, the opposite side, of course, to the British, where they very skillfully concealed their trenches. And they were essentially lying in ambush, awaiting the British to try and force their way across drifts, which are um, quite common in the Tagela River as a slow flowing river. You can wade across it at certain points. The bridges had been blown. The only way for the British to cross was to assault these drifts. <clears throat> now, this was not known to the British, who incorrectly believed that the, the, um, the Boers were occupying the summit. That seemed to make military sense, and the Boers had added to this by constructing many dummy trenches, which drew British fire. And the initial British bombardment, a preparatory bombardment, the day before the assault, the 14th of December, uh, fell in almost entirely on these empty trenches. It wounded three Boers. The heaviest bombardment a British army had launched since the Crimean War managed to wound three men, and these were shells that had actually fallen short. No, no balls were actually killed because, of course, these shells were not hitting occupied positions. And then the next day, the assault would begin. Assaulting across a river, even against what was at this stage still considered a some, something of an untrained rabble, the balls, uh, rather underestimated this stage, assaulting across the river is never an easy task. And so Reavers Buller assigned two full field batteries, the 14th and the 66th battery, to go forward with the assaulting columns, get to relatively close range and provide direct fire support as they were fighting their way across the drifts. But things went wrong. The man in charge of these batteries, 
Colonel Charles Long, a man known as Thundering Charlie for his aggression and perhaps his recklessness in previous actions, somehow got the distance wrong. He claimed later he was distracted by the atmospherics of South Africa and he galloped too close. Um, later, he told another friend that when Buller was pointing out where he wanted uh, Long to put his batteries, Buller's damned fat thumb covered three squares of the map. Whatever the exact case, Long got much too close to the Boer lines. He was a really intending to, or he's supposed to deploy about 2,000, 2,500 yards away, safe range for artillery. In fact, he galloped perhaps as close as 1,000 yards and perhaps even closer than that. Remember, the Boers are laying in ambush. They saw the, the batteries right in front of them. They could not believe their luck. Artillery batteries limbered up at point blank range and they opened fire. 66th Battery managed to deploy re relatively unscathed, but 14th Battery, uh, pictured here, was absolutely flayed by bullets as it attempted to deploy. Despite the initial uh, shock, all 12 guns, six guns for battery, managed to get into action, but very quickly they were shot up. Uh, Long himself was mown down by shrapnel. His second in command was killed by a bullet. Uh, the gunners and the horse, the horse teams were almost entirely annihilated. Uh, the gun crews clung onto their position for about an hour. Remember, there's no gun shields on the guns they're using, 15 pounders, before they too were driven from their guns by bore shrapnel and bought rifle fire. And they retreated back. They did not spike their guns. They thought this was a temporary fallback. Um, but they fell back into uh, a position further, further behind and the guns were left abandoned in the field. Now, one of these guns had been destroyed by a direct bore hit from a shell, but 11 other guns were lying ready to be taken. And at this stage of um, the war, this, uh, the, the field force was relatively small. These 12 guns represented more than a quarter of Buller's entire field artillery, and they were simply lying in what was effectively no man's land, waiting uh, to be taken. This was a disaster in the making. And add on top of this, the idea that, that was very current in the Royal Artillery at the time, that a, a gun should be treated with the same gravitas as a battle standard, and you can see the makings of a true disaster. This is where Walter Congreve enters our story. Buller and his headquarters party, and remember that Congreve is the press censor in headquarters, moved forward and started to observe this position, and Buller started to organise a uh, rescue attempt to try and bring these guns back. Captain Schofield, Royal Artillery, was ordered to take his gun teams, his limber teams forward and try and bring out as many guns as possible. As they were organising this, um, they were about 2,000 yards away from the Boer trenches. The Boer's famous marksmen, a number of snipers in their, in their ranks, would start to take pot shots at Buller and his party. Buller was actually hit by a spent bullet, bounced off him, left him with a bruise. A medical officer who was stood between Buller and Congreve was shot dead by a sniper. And Walter himself, who was leaning on a swagger stick, a walking cane, that cane was shot out from under his hand, perhaps by the same sniper who just killed the, um, the medical officer who was between them. So this was, a, was what might be termed a hot position. As Schofield was assembling his teams, Buller turned to his own staff and he said simply, some of you go and help. Congreve and his very good friend here, Frederick Freddie Roberts, Lord Roberts' only son, uh, both volunteered their services and they both galloped forward along with Schofield and his gun teams. Now remember that these uh, artillery pieces are perhaps within 800 yards of Boer riflemen and some Boers have decided to creep forward, get even closer. The specialist snipers uh, just waiting for British officers to show their heads. There's also Boer shrapnel shells falling amongst this and this ground is entirely open. There is no cover whatsoever. The only defence that the British teams have as they move forward is sheer speed. So this is an extremely daring and dangerous attempt to retrieve these guns, but it has to be made because the artillery is so precious. And I'm going to read to you uh, how Walter described what happened next. Riding forward, he said, he remembered this. I have never seen, even at field fire, bullets fly thicker. All one could see was little tufts of dust all over the ground, and one heard a whistling noise and a pt where they hit, and an unceasing rattle of musketry somewhere in the front. My first bullet went through my left sleeve and just made the point of my elbow bleed. Next, a clod of earth caught me no end of a smack on the other arm. Next, my, then my horse got one, then my right leg one, then my horse another, and that settled us, for he plunged and I fell about 100 yards short of the guns we were going to. A little nuller, that's a dry water course that only runs in heavy rain, was close by, and into that I hobbled and sat down. 
It was not much shelter, however, and I had not been in it in it for a minute before another bullet hit my toe, went into the welt, travelled up, and came out at the toe cap two inches from the end of the toe. It did not scratch me, but I shifted my quarters to a better place. Now, that bullet that had hit Walter's leg had gone through his leg approximately three inches below his knee. It had entered through his shin and it had exited out the back of his calf. He was very lucky that it hadn't shattered the bone, it had grazed the bone, and it hadn't severed any arteries. Uh, but it was an extremely painful wound indeed. He was lucky because there happened to be a medical officer in the nullah who was able to dress his wound uh, and, prevent him, and prevent him from bleeding in these conditions. But as Schofield and his gun teams reached uh, the abandoned gun line, they managed to draw off two guns uh, for uh, some casualties. Walter began to wonder what had happened to his great friend, Freddie. And he looked out and he remembered what that, as the, Freddie had been riding forward with him, Freddie had, and I quote, been cantering alongside those limbers, laughing and talking and slapping his leg with a stick as though we were on, an, on the mall again. But looking out over the nullah, Walter could see uh, Freddie had been shot down, his horse had been shot from under him, and Freddie was lying with multiple bullet wounds about 20 yards from the gun line. So he got further than Congreve, but not much further. Now, bear in mind, Congreve has, a, uh, has effectively a disabled leg, but he, and, and this, this area is still being swept with bullets, but Congreve limbers out on what he describes himself as a very stiff and very painful leg, and he hobbles about 80 yards Remember, he's been shot down about 100 yards. He was about 80 yards out to Roberts and starts to try and drag him towards the nullah. He's on his own. He turns around and he shouts for other men to help him. There's some other officers and men hiding in that nullah. They run out and they all manage to carry him into uh, the nullah which itself, the walls are only about three inches high and they're being continuously struck by bullets, so everyone has to lie flat. They endure a beast of a day under a South African summer heat. Uh, Roberts is dying, he's mortally wounded. Uh, uh, they do their best to make him comfortable, but they can't do much else for him. Uh, there's no prospect of, uh, of, of getting him away. There's too many bullets, there's too much chaos uh, going on around him, and so all they can do is try and make him comfortable. There are three further attempts to retrieve guns, all of them are shot down. No further guns are, uh, are retrieved after Schofield had retrieved two. As the sun begins to set on the battlefield, uh, it's clear they cannot retrieve the guns and the British Army falls back from the position. The Boers come out, they capture the guns. It's the heaviest loss of guns since the Napoleonic Wars. And they find Congreve and Roberts in the nullah. Uh, they realise that they're very badly, uh, certainly Roberts is fatally wounded, Congreve is quite badly wounded, and they disarm them, they take their weaponry, uh, and equipment, and then they let them go. They actually return them to British lines. There's still an, a gentlemanly air about the war at this stage. Uh, Roberts dies the next day. His, his war, wounds are mortal. Of course, Congreve survives, and he wins the Victoria Cross alongside Roberts uh, for their bravery in this particular action. There's actually a, a little side story to this in that Roberts and Congreve win the Victoria Cross because they have volunteered to go and help Schofield. But Schofield initially only wins the DSO because he's been ordered to retrieve the guns, even though he's endured similar dangers uh, and similar uh, perils. Interestingly, though, two uh, drivers actually win the VC as well from uh, Schofield's teams, but Schofield himself doesn't win it. It causes a scandal that goes right to the top of the army, and eventually he's, um, his DSO is changed for a Victoria Cross in 1901, two years after the event. But uh, Congreve wins the Victoria Cross alongside another man who's just become a father and son VC, Freddie Roberts, but sadly his VC is awarded posthumously as he dies a day after the action. And this makes Congreve an instant celebrity. VC winners in the Boer War are sources of national and perhaps even world fascination due to the strength of the empire. And Congreve starts to receive what we can only describe as fan mail. Fan mail from children who admire him, fan mail from men who want to congratulate him, and fan mail from women who want to, um, well, I'll leave that to your imagination. And Congreve actually hates it. He, remember, this is a man who despises luxury, and he certainly has no wish to be famous, although he's got a famous name. He rejects it. He absolutely hates it. And he, he describes himself that he, he despises the celebrity ship assigned to Victoria Crosses and writes rather angrily, angrily in his diary that if it was up to him, no officers would ever receive the Victoria Cross because they're just doing what they're supposed to be doing. He'd only give it to NCOs and men. And then he adds underneath that entry, I don't think my ideas are likely to be accepted. 
indeed not. Now, Congreve uh, recovers from his wound and he stays in the, uh, in the Boer War and he fights effectively to its end. And he becomes quite disillusioned with the events of the Boer War. He starts to almost, almost sympathise with the Boers. He's certainly against the British scorched earth policy. And he writes himself that if it was, the roles were reversed, he would certainly just continue fighting. It wouldn't make him give up. It would actually anger him and make him fight more. And his letters and his diary entries becoming darker and darker as the Boer War goes on. This is not suiting him. He doesn't really have much uh, opportunity to put his own ideas into practice. And he becomes quite, quite, uh, quite miserable about it. But there's one joy that he actually has during the Boer War. And that's writing to his eldest son, William or Billy Congreve. Calling to, what, he prefers the name Billy because it separates him from that vast line of William Congreves um, that, of course, stretch back into uh, centuries past. So by becoming Billy, he is uh, identifying himself, making himself unique. Billy is in many ways the opposite of his father, Walter, whereas Walter is certainly physically very brave. He's also very self-denying. He's quite cool. He's quite compact. Uh, Billy is none of these things. He's also no intellectual giant, whereas Walter had had the brains to go to uh, Oxford University. Uh, Billy struggles at Eton. He's a very, very difficult student. He's frequently in trouble. He's got an almost unlimited vocabulary of back chat for masters and prefects, and he hates it. He hates the discipline. He hates the tedium of school. He's, he's just dead against it. But the one pleasure that um, perhaps Billy has and also Walter has is that in, uh, while Walter's in South Africa, they develop a very, very lively correspondence. Now, bear in mind, of course, William's only 10 at this, uh, you know, or he's, he's quite young, but he writes very well despite this. They share all sorts of stories, and what's striking about their correspondence is there's a clear love here. And when we tend to think of Edwardian families or late Victorian families, we often think of uh, an emotional remoteness between fathers and sons, perhaps great example of this is Lord Randolph Church and Winston Church, where Lord Randolph was, uh, to say the very least, uh, disinterested in his son's activities. But that's not true with the Congress. They have a very, very close relationship, and it's born, really, in the South African War. They write to each other on a, tr the, a tremendously regular basis. There's voluminous correspondence between them. And it continues after Walter returns to Britain and returns to army duties. Uh, Billy, of course, at Eton by now, very unhappy, um, doesn't do well at school, doesn't achieve well, uh, writes a lot to his father here, and his father offers a lot of love and tenderness and encouragement. I should say, leaving with a strong element of book your ideas of young man. But nevertheless, it's striking that that relationship exists in a world which we tend to think of austere and rather self-denying. And given that Walter is, is a self-denying man, I think his very close love for his eldest son really shines through. Billy's desperate to follow in his father's footsteps and indeed the family's footsteps. He's got no interest in doing anything but joining the army and seeing action. He doesn't want to join the army and just, just sit on his backside. He wants action. But his grades at Eton are so poor, he has to have a, a crammer, somebody who's going to help you pass exams, employed to get him into staff college. Um, and it's, a, it's a near run thing, but he, he excels once he's there. He passes out in the top three of his class, he's actually second in his particular class. And of course, there's only ever one unit he's going to join, and that's his father's unit, the Rifle Brigade, and he's commissioned into it in 1911, to the mutual delight of both he and his father. Photograph of him here just on the very eve of the First World War. <clears throat> war comes and both men go to war in the first wave. <clears throat> Walter himself goes to war with 18th Brigade, um, soon promoted to command 6th Division and then later to command 13th Corps, whereas Billy goes out initially with 3rd Rifle Brigade as a regimental officer, uh, but then becomes a staff officer, first with 67th Brigade, and then 76th Brigade. Both men do very well in the early part of the war. Um, turning to Walter first, he's in, he experiences a steady increase in, uh, in rank. He admits in his, in his diary in December 1914, he feels uninitiated in trench warfare and that all his past experience has not prepared him for the nature of, of the type of combat he's now seeing. But he also perhaps quicker than other officers, perceives the importance of maintaining morale amongst his men, entering into uh, their, um, 
you know, understanding their problems and indeed looking after them. And of course, he's a man who has no interest in uh, and no interest in, in luxury himself and so on, but he's quite keen in actually trying to improve the lot of, of his men. <clears throat> and he takes great efforts to try and uh, ensure trenches are improved, stores are available and so on. His approach to command, he actually sums up himself in a memorandum that's circulated to 19th Brigade. He says, be just yet severe, never overlook a fault, yet be human. Keep up your dignity, but at the same time, enter into your men's joys and sorrows and be their friend. See to their comforts before your own, but this will entail knowing what they should receive in rations, clothing, etc. Uh, his men nicknamed him Old Concrete, which I think is a wonderful nickname for the, this sort of stoic, tough man. Uh, they were aware of his own, uh, his own physical toughness, his resilience, and so on and so forth, and he was much liked. Um, his staff, however, had different outlooks. They thought Congreve was perhaps a little bit too brave, a little bit too interested in the front line, but I'll return to that idea in a little bit. Some idea of the popularity of Congreve is given that when he left 6th Division and moved to 13th Corps at the end of November, at the end of 19, uh, late 1915, he found this quite a bittersweet promotion. Uh, 40, 18th Brigade, sorry, was part of 6th Division. And so some of the men that he was leaving behind, he commanded from the outbreak of war up until uh, his promotion to 13th Corps. This was quite a, 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 a bittersweet parting. And he actually um, wrote this about his experience. He said, <clears throat> Dear dirty fellows, how I do hate leaving them all in the discomforts and dangers of those parts, those parts being the, uh, the East salient. If only I could have brought them with me, of course, bring them to 13th Corps. That, of course, was impossible. Uh, Billy actually witnessed uh, Walter saying goodbye to the 6th Division, and he remembered this. He said, I was filled with pride and then almost reduced to tears when hundreds and hundreds of men rushed out along the road and cheered him. Real cheering, real underlined. It made me quite miserable, and I think he nearly wept. Lieutenant generals can weep. And I think, again, that shows some of the dual nature of Walter Congreve, this incredibly tough man who denied himself any play, any, even the smallest pleasures, and lived a, almost a thick life. But he could actually feel a great deal of emotion. He had a lot of empathy with his men, uh, not to mention uh, with his eldest son, Billy. So Walter's greatest achievement, and indeed what made him uh, be promoted to the 13th Corps, was the retaking of Hooge, a, uh, a site of tremendously bitter fighting in 1915. It was retaken by 6th Division in the, uh, the late summer and uh, early autumn of 1915. Uh, a small action, but one that was almost a perfect example of what could be achieved when the um, the ends were matched by the means, a small, almost a miniature bite and hold operation, very well conducted, and one that attracted the notice of um, Congreve's superiors and led to him taking corps command. Billy, of course, was actually in the Hooge sector and was uh, serving as a staff officer. And we start to see the difference in personality between the two, whereas Walter himself was relatively quiet was stern, was quite taciturn. Uh, Billy was a ball of fire. If Walter was the, the cold ice, Billy was the, the burning heat. And talking of burning heat, wherever the action was fiercest, wherever it was hottest, that's where Billy was drawn. He was drawn to action like a moth to a flame. And even though he was a staff officer who didn't have any great uh, necessity to go out so close to the front line or to get so closely involved in action, he could never resist the opportunity. He was always near where action was. He was always in the thick of it. He absolutely fearless when it came to being in proximity to the enemy. And Walter actually uh, became a little bit concerned about how much Billy was running risks and getting so close to the front line. Uh, and he, did, he told Billy that he thought it was very wrong that Billy was running these type of risks, but later conceded that it was simply in Billy's nature. And my goodness, it was. This was a man who loved action. He was physically fearless, morally fearless. He'd certainly speak his mind. And he just was drawn to action like a moth to a flame. And some idea about how much he was drawn to action is that by the end of 1915, he'd won a military cross, a Légion d'Honneur, and he'd been mentioned in dispatches three times. Uh, not bad for a year's work as a staff officer, remember. Um, a remarkable achievement and one that, uh, is, although there were many brave men, of course, in the BF, one that does stand out as, a, as quite the achievement for a young staff officer. <coughs> 
Billy's um, adventures would continue into 1916 when he would win a DSO at the St. Eloi Craters on the 3rd of April 1916. Now, as many of you, I'm sure, will know, this was an area of incessant underground warfare, underground mines being detonated, but then producing craters, rather like the one you see here, which became the site of incessant combat. And it actually served as quite good and quite effective ad hoc defensive positions. You could man the sides of the crater and it gave you a certain amount of cover it was difficult to get artillery fire in there uh, and you were shielded from small arms fire and it was during the fighting for control of the Saint Eloir craters that Billy would win his next medal uh, in his ever-growing collection uh, which of course was his DSO and this was a, a typical Billy Congre adventure uh, encapsulating some of his attitude the fighting was going on for a position that was known rather unglamorously simply as crater number five Intense fighting uh, across the line for various various crates, but crate number five was the one that drew Billy's attention. And he noticed that although um, parts of the uh, the crates were being very heavily defended, a lot of rifle fire being delivered by the German defenders there, looking through his binoculars, he noticed that in another part of the crater, remember these are quite big craters, uh, some Germans were waving a sandbag which had been impaled onto a bayoneted rifle and were waving it above their heads, which seemed to indicate to Billy's mind at least, that they were willing to surrender. Now, it may have actually been that they were signaling something or giving some other message, but Billy thought this was an attempt to surrender. And he felt that it was his duty to go forward and take this surrender as a staff officer. Now remember that there's still plenty of gunfire coming from this crater, so it's clear that not everybody's surrendering, but that didn't discourage Congreve in the slightest. So he gathered together a small party to go and sort this situation out. This included him, another officer, and four men who he happened to find standing around. Uh, he was able to gather them all together and he led them across no man's land. Congreve himself reflected that this, about halfway across, heading towards his crater, he may have had a flutter of fear. Um, some Germans started firing at him and his party, but to his immense relief, uh, all the bullets flew overhead, despite the fact that he later admitted he expected to get a bullet at any moment. All the rifle shots directed at Congreve's party flew over his head. He was able to reach the edge of the crater uh, and climb up the side and peered over the top. And he was expecting to find a group of broken and demoralized Germans, about a handful of them, who he could then separate from the main group and lead away into captivity. But I'm going to let you hear what Billy said about this. He said, imagine my surprise and horror when I saw a whole crowd of armed Boches. I stood there for a moment, feeling a bit sort of shy, and then I leveled my revolver at the nearest Bosch and shouted, hands up, all, the lot of you. A few went up at once, and then a few more, and then the lot, and I felt the proudest fellow in the world as I cursed them. This was an audacious bluff. Remember, his entire party is six men strong, uh, but he managed to capture every single German in crater number five, which consisted of five officers and 77 men. Not a bad haul for a small party being led by a staff officer uh, with a revolver. He was actually nominated for the Victoria Cross for this award, for, for this act of bravery, uh, but in fact he was given a DSO in May 1916. And this was a particularly happy time for, um, uh, for Congreve. He won the DSO and then a fortnight later he married uh, Maud, uh, his wife. <clears throat> By now, with the military cross, DSO, a Légion d'honneur, three mentions and dispatches, Congreve had greatly established his reputation as every bit as brave as any officer in the British Army. But there's something else about Billy Congreve, which again puts him in contrast to Walter. Walter quite cold, quite a cold fish, uh, Billy anything but. Uh, one example I'd like to give you, I think, captures that more than anything else. And that's at Christmas 1915, it's actually before this incident, uh, Billy noted in his diary that he had, and I quote, I had planned a gorgeous Bosch strafe for Christmas Day just to show him how much we can really hate. Billy hated the Germans. He had an intense dislike of the German military. He, he was appalled by the sight of refugees. He was appalled by the destruction that the war had wrought upon terrain. He was appalled by destroyed villages and the willingness of the Germans to annihilate the countryside around them. And he was particularly appalled by the German decision to use poison gas at Ypres in early 1915. So he absolutely despised the Germans and had no compunction about doing his best to, to try and kill them. 
So he planned this enormous Bosch tray for Christmas Day. Uh, that had, was not going to go ahead, though, because his corps commander came in uh, and gave him an order saying, no action to be taken by us on Christmas Day, which is likely to provoke a retaliation on the part of the Germans. And Congreve wrote indignantly in his diary, was ever an order given to, an order given before, such an order given before? I expect the corps commander is leaving off trousers and putting on skirts. Uh, that corps commander, incidentally, was uh, Lieutenant General Fanshaw, who would have sort of various problems in 1916. So Congreve's Christmas Day was ruined. He wasn't going to be able to carry out a bombardment on the Germans after all. But he consoled himself in his diary because he said, at least my artillery plans will do for New Year's Day. And indeed, he did deliver that artillery bombardment on New Year's Day, giving you again some idea of his intensity and his desire to carry out um, to fight the war to its fullest and most ferocious extent. And in this, he was in contrast to Walter. But destiny was calling Billy Congreve and indeed Walter Congreve, uh, both to the same sector of the Battle of the Somme. You'll remember that Walter had been promoted to command 13th Corps, which was in the southernmost sector of the Somme battlefield. Walter had a difficult relationship with Henry Rawlinson, commanding the army. Rawlinson and Congreve were friends, but it was a cautious kind of friendship. Rawlinson didn't trust Congreve, that he was too cautious, criticised his plans, visited 13th Corps more than any other corps during the preparation for the Battle of the Somme. Um, indeed, created such tension with Congreve that Congreve went over Rawlinson's head and went directly to Douglas Haig. Haig and Congreve had no real sort of relationship, uh, but Congreve went directly to Haig. Remember, by virtue of being a VC winner and coming from a very powerful military family, Congreve has a certain amount of influence and pull. And under this criticism from Rawlinson, Congreve asked Haig if he had Haig's confidence, Haig's faith. Haig refused to meet Congreve, uh, but instead sent an officer who assured him that there was absolutely no, um, there was no doubt that they had faith in Congreve. And Congreve wrote rather bitterly in his diary at the time that he didn't trust Haig or Rawlinson, and they only put faith in men who'd been in First Army uh, in 1916. I will say a little bit more about Congreve and Haig's relationship in a slide or two's time. Congreve's plan with 13th Corps on the southern sector of the Somme Front for all Rawlinson's criticism, for all his um, interfering and, and uh, damning uh, efforts, would, of course, turn out to be one of the few, perhaps the only clear-cut success story on the 1st of July 1916. 13th Corps secured all of its objectives at a comparatively low cost compared to other sections of the front. And indeed, the German defence here were gravely shaken, perhaps even broken. There were accounts of German troops fleeing back in disorder, abandoning equipment, running effectively through open country with very little uh, for them to cling on to. A German counterattack that went in on the uh, in the early hours of the 2nd of, Ju of July ran into consolidated 13th Corps defences and was simply blown apart. Indeed, the German commander of that counterattack was so furious at the waste of his men that he wrote a very bitter letter up the chain of command saying that such attack counterattacks were utterly futile without artillery preparation. There's an enduring and incredibly tempting story about 13th Corps on the 1st of July. And this, I believe, originates with Marty Middlebrook's seminal uh, first day of the Somme. And this myth is that Congreve, having seen 13th Corps break the German line, or at least capture all its objectives, asked for cavalry to be put through to exploit the success. It's a wonderful story. I have searched and searched and searched, and I desperately wanted to find evidence that this was true, but I can find absolutely nothing in Congreve's papers, Rawlinson's papers, or 13th Corps' diary. Remember that Rawlinson actually criticised Congreve for being too cautious in his plan and not, not putting enough uh, oomph into it. Congreve himself had a very well worked out plan to consolidate his positions once he'd captured them, and there was very little cavalry behind the front line anyway. So as tempting as that story is, and I'm not sure of its origin, I'm afraid I could not find any evidence to say it was true. And what we know about Congreve being a pretty careful operator, uh, preferring a more bite and hold approach to a greater harouche, it seems unlikely he'd have suddenly asked the cavalry to be thrown through anyway. So as tempting as that story is, I'm afraid I've not been able to prove it and I have grave doubts that it actually happened. But what did certainly happen is that 13th Corps captured its objectives, achieved everything it had been, uh, it had hoped to achieve, and did extraordinarily well on the first day of the Somme. 
But that failure to exploit in the South meant that a number of positions that could have perhaps been taken with relatively low cost, in fact, the Germans reinforced, fortified, and these became real battlegrounds as the Battle of the Somme ground on. A great example, uh, the village or the ruins pictured here, the village of Longueval, perhaps there for the taking on the 1st of July, later the scene of incessant and bitter fighting. And this is where um, the moment of destiny for Walter and William finally occurs. Billy's 76th Brigade is actually put into 3rd uh, Corps and becomes a, a reinforcement for it. But the intensity of the Battle of the Somme means that there's no opportunity for father and son to meet about this or indeed comment on this twist of fate. Indeed, the fighting in the Somme is so intense that Billy stops keeping his diary properly and the wonderful correspondence he has with his father uh, starts to come to a halt because they simply don't have time to write to one another in the, uh, in the intense fighting that's following. And this leads to a moment uh, that will ultimately be uh, Billy's last act of the war. On the 20th of July 1916, 76th Brigade is assaulting Longueval once more, another uh, attempt at the village. When the attack miscarries horribly, the battalions advance piecemeal, easily fought off by the Germans, and then just to add insult to injury, as they're falling back, they're hit by friendly fire from British machine guns who mistake them in the, uh, the early morning light for German troops. It's a, a, a typical disaster, a typical piecemeal disaster of that uh, era of the Battle of the Somme. Billy, as a snap officer, goes forward as it becomes daylight, to try and reorganize the line. And this particular area is a complete wilderness, a labyrinth, if you will, of shell holes, ruined equipment, so knocked out guns, gun pits, hasty scrapes, uh, dead bodies and rubble. It's complete chaos here. And Billy spends a long time actually trying to find a suitable position from which to observe the German lines. Eventually he takes a position in the German gun pit and starts to observe them through his binoculars. Billy is not well. By his own admission, he's suffering from the effects of shell blasts, by that he means concussion, and the fumes that come from them, the, uh, the noxious fumes, and poison gas. Uh, he's pale and drawn, contemporaries know he's not looking well. He's never carried any weight, but he's lost weight. He's a man who's been under all the pressure. He's been in almost continuous combat now for a fortnight. He's observing the German lines from his from this ruined German gun pit. And an officer who's with him, a, a man called Stubbs, suddenly feels a, a tremendous sense of worry about Congreve and actually tells him to keep his head down because the area is infested with German snipers. Congreve just gives a small dismissive laugh and carries on with his work. Having finished his uh, reconnoitering, Congreve uh, um, climbs out of the gun pit, he climbs into a trench that's being constructed by British troops and he starts to talk to the sergeant in charge of the working party and just as he says the word work, he is shot by a German sniper, a single shot that killed him instantly. He's dead before he hits the floor. Those snipers that Stubbs had warned him about, one of them had picked him up, clearly had tracked him, and now shot him dead in just a moment. It was a tragic but perhaps inevitable end for a man who could not resist being so close to the front line and so close to action. But his popularity with 76th Brigade was such that it led to a, a rare occasion, a spontaneous request, uh, sponsored by the officers and men of 76th Brigade, that Billy should receive the VC for uh, the tremendous work that he'd done uh, for conspicuous bravery in the fortnight preceding his death, where he'd been in the thick of the action uh, throughout. Um, his wife, Pamela, now pregnant with their daughter, received that award on the 1st of November, 1916, the daughter would be Mary. The death of Billy Congreve was a terrible blow to his father. Remember how close they had been, how much love they had shared together. And even though Walter was this very tough man, a self-denying man, nevertheless, the loss of his eldest son, who he had a tremendously close relationship with, hit him extremely hard. He had very little time to grieve. Remember, he's still commanding 13th Corps at this stage. An observer in his headquarters remembered that when the news came in that Billy had been killed, uh, Walter was absolutely calm to outward appearances. And then, after a few seconds of silence, said quite calmly, he was a good soldier, a typical reserved Edwardian approach. But in private, this grief was very raw. And Walter's um, diary gets this across. This is his diary entry. He'd gone to see Billy lying in the mortuary uh, prior to burial. And he wrote this. He said, I saw him and was struck by his beauty and strength of face. I felt inspired by his look and know that he is helping me, as he used to say, and that he will always do so 
I never felt so proud of him as I did when I said goodbye to him. A lot of flowers were sent by kind people, amongst them wild mallows from the fighting line by some of the men. I myself put in his hand a posy of poppies, cornflowers and daisies, and with a kiss I left him. I know I shall see him again. And this is powerful stuff by anybody's standards and coming from a tough, Victor a tough Victorian, effectively, officer who was now fighting in the First World War, I think it's incredibly poignant and it's incredibly powerful and it gets across better than anything else that I can have said just how close Walter and Billy were. But Walter's war was not over. His uh, campaign on the Somme was brought to a, a shortened end when he contracted cholera, probably from the drinking contaminated water uh, in the summer of 1916. This sent him home uh, while he recovered, but he would return in time for the Battle of Arras in 1917. Walter's career as a corps commander was troubled by two related problems. One was his absolute fascination with the front line rather like Billy in this sense, but with a different approach, whereas Billy loved to be close to action and to be involved in it. Walter's primary interest in visiting the front line was to see things for himself and also to try and uh, give, uh, sort things out and make sure that the men were being looked after properly. Nevertheless, this could result in elements of daring. Walter was particularly keen in being taken into the air on reconnaissance flights. His very first flight in a reconnaissance aircraft was prior to the Battle of the Somme, but he kept this habit up, insisting on being put in the observer's seat as reconnaissance aircraft took to the skies. And of course, in the spring of 1917, this was very dangerous. The skies were by no means safe. Uh, but Walter, nevertheless, still insisted on being taken up, saying he had complete faith in the skills of the pilots who would be flying him. A danger, a man who liked to uh, take risks. But his obsession, if that's quite the right word, his interest, perhaps, in going into the front line meant that his staff were largely left to his own devices. And if Walter had one flaw as a commander, particularly a corps commander, is that he didn't look after, he didn't properly take control of his staff. His uh, A and his Q branch, his, uh, his, his operations and his um, adjutant branch, were in a state of constant, uh, constant conflict with one another. Indeed, one officer described it as a constant state of armed neutrality amongst the staff in 13th Corps. They were always jockeying for position, they were always jockeying for resources, and because Congo was more interested in the soldiers and in the front line, he didn't properly take control of them. His flaw seems to have been that he expected his staff to act as he would act. He thought they would simply live up to his standards. But of course, as anybody who's ever tried to run a team or been in any charge of anything, sporting team, social team or work team knows, uh, the worst thing you can possibly do is assume that everybody thinks like you. And Walter seems to have think, thought that everybody would um, put aside personal ambitions, personal jealousies, personal animosities, and concentrate on working together. That wasn't the case, and so he snapped or constantly squabbling with each other. And officers who were transferred into the 13th Corps often commented on this rather hostile environment that they faced because Walter was more interested in the front line. That interest in the front line would ultimately cost Walter uh, a physical, uh, cost him physically uh, and indeed mentally, I've mentioned his absolute fascination with visiting the front line, and in June 1917, his luck in the front line finally ran out. Uh, one of his contemporaries noted, his personal courage was extraordinary. He was always amongst the front line troops and was a magnificent example to the men of showing complete disregard of shelling or any other form of Bosch hatred. Now, you might disregard shelling, but shelling does not disregard you. And during a tour of the, uh, the front, in June 1917, he actually climbed out of a trench and was walking, not in no man's land, but in the ground between the front line and the communications trench. When a German shell sailed over, uh, he was caught in the blast and his left hand uh, was left hanging by a thread. Uh, and he was very badly bloodied and knocked about. He was rushed to a, a first aid station, but his hand could not be saved. It had to be amputated. He became the third Congreve to lose their left hand in battle. Uh, two previous Congolese have both lost their left hand or indeed their left arm in battles in the 18th century. So he was in good company here. Having been operated on and um, infection prevented, he wrote to his commander, Henry Horn, and began the letter in typical Congolese style. He said, Dear General, barring the loss of a left hand, I am much as usual. 
Congreve was offered a prosthetic hand. These were available, but he insisted instead on having a hook hand because this was the type of hand that his ancestors, I've just mentioned, had used. And he insisted on taking the hook hand instead of the more fashionable prosthetic. And that hook hand is now uh, on display in the Royal Green Jackets Museum. Recovering from his wound kept him out of action for most of 1917, and he returned to Fifth Army just in time for the German Spring Offensive in 1918. But by now, Congreve's powers were fading. His asthma was crippling. He often found himself confined to bed. No amount of will could force yourself through that type of ailment. And people, uh, contemporaries, noted that the loss of Billy had told upon him, had drained some of the energy from him, not to mention the very severe wound, the loss of his left hand. This was a man who had been through the mill. And his conduct in 1980 uh, is controversial. Some have criticised him for um, trying to defend the front line uh, with too much putting too much in the front line and allowing it to be breached. I would argue, having studied his, his decision to do that, the reason he put troops in the front line was that there was very little behind the front line on Fifth Army sector. It's all well and good saying that the defence in depth should be mounted, but that rather assumes that there is something to defend in depth. And certainly in his core sector, there was very, very little in way uh, behind the front line. So he's, he's the decision to try and defend the front line was perhaps sensible. But some of his other decisions as the campaign wore on were more questionable. And certainly his health was a serious problem. You do not want a corps commander crippled with asthma and bronchitis at the height of a battle. And he, along with a number of other commanders in the summer of 1918, uh, became victims of the purge of Fifth Army, which, of course, saw Hubert Goff sent home as well. And Congreve was sent home. Um, he actually requested an interview with Douglas Hay. Uh, Haig refused even to meet him, refused to correspond with him, which put Congreve very firmly against Haig uh, for the remainder of Congreve's life. And Congreve uh, became a much closer friend to Goff, who he also, of course, knew through his time uh, at Fifth Army. The two actually got on rather well, despite Goff often being very difficult. Uh, Congreve didn't take any nonsense from Goff and was perfectly happy in telling Goff what he thought. And that was the way you won Goff's respect. And so he and Goff actually maintained a friendship uh, up until... Congreve's death. Congreve was sent home, but he was sent home with, with honour. He was promoted to full general, and he'd later go on to command occupation forces in the Middle East before ending his life uh, as governor of Malta, where he found that the warm climate eased his asthma and allowed him to uh, breathe more easily. As governor of Malta, though, he had to attend a number of um, high, uh, high ranking functions. Not the easiest job for a man who hated luxury and hated fine dining, but he used to have a party trick that his wife uh, were related. Remember, he still got his hook hand. Even after the war, he refused to change him for a prosthetic, always carried his hook with him. And one of his party tricks, well attested to by people who knew in, in the uh, 1920s uh, in Malta, was he would be sat at a, a great function or so on, and he would turn to the person on his left, and he would ask this person to hand him something, usually a knife or a fork or perhaps a spoon. The person, of course, wants to do well by the general. He then will pick up, he or she will pick up a knife or a fork and go to hand it to and Walter would hold out the hook hand as a form of test to see would this person try and balance it in the hook hand, of course, essentially impossible, or would they have the courage and confidence to actually do something else? Uh, and he found that the vast majority of people tried desperately and ineffectually to place it in his hook hand. And so this was one of his great amusements, uh, known very well to his family. And it shows that even in his, uh, his, his later years, he still had a certain sense of um, you know, being a trickster or being a bit scurrilous that might explain that incident all those years ago where he had shot one of his lecturers with an air rifle. But of course, the loss of his son uh, did weigh heavily upon him. He spoke very, very little of Billy in the years that followed. And not long before uh, Walter's death, in fact, his asthma very, very bad and, and clearly bronchitis is quite regular. He was interviewed by his biographer, a man called Thornton. And Thornton asked, Walter for a an epitaph for Billy and bear in mind this was still a raw event even though it had been some 10 years since Billy's death but Walter gave a very very controlled reply remember of course they were both members of the rifle brigade Billy had dreamt of being a rifleman throughout his time at Eton and Walter simply said he would have made a good rifleman and for a man and indeed a family who was so proud of their regiments I don't think there could be any higher praise. 
Here's the final resting places of William and Walter. Walter was actually buried at sea off the coast of Malta. There's a headstone there in an area that's known as the Congreve Channel. Uh, it was not brought home, decided to be buried here. Uh, Walter, and, and relatively difficult actually to visit, uh, visit his resting place, but it is still there. And of course, many of you I'm sure will have visited William's uh, grave uh, um, headstone here. It's now just short of an hour. I've managed to bring us in with, the, with time to spare. And so I hope you've enjoyed my gallop through the remarkable lives of William and Walter Congreve. And at this stage, I'd be really happy to take any questions you may have uh, through the intermediary of my host, David. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Spencer. That was uh, tremendous. Thoroughly enjoyed that. If, uh, I know that uh, we can't clap in these unusual times, but if you want to raise your hand, uh, on the on the system just to show your appreciation for Spencer that would be tremendous um thanks for doing that oh look at all those hands going up there tremendous thanks very much indeed everybody and uh, we've, we've got some uh, some questions already um, right. so now now's the time for us just to start going down the questions but if you have any questions that you'd like Spencer to uh, answer just type them in on the um Button below. Um, hopefully, I'm pointing to the to the correct space. That's where it's showing on my PC. So, if you've got any questions, just please type them in. So, Spencer, um, let me just have a quick look. So, the first um, the first question came in. Well, it was ten minutes before we started from from Adrian. Um, is there any monetary award for being granted a medal? I think uh, Adrian probably means is there any monetary reward for a Victoria Cross? Um, um, do you know, I don't believe there is, uh, or at least certainly not in the, the Congreve period. Um, I don't believe it comes with any sort of, of monetary reward. Now, you could, and this is something that, that Walter was approached about, you could certainly parlay your Victoria Cross into, um, into an award. So Walter was offered a lot of money by a publisher in 1900 to write the story of the guns at Colenso. And, of course, he was absolutely the wrong person to ask. And he, <laughs> yeah. he, decidedly uh he absolutely said no uh, of course vcs themselves you you couldn't pawn them as um alfred pollard author of memoirs of a fire eater discovered disillusioned with the with with life in the 1920s coming out of a disastrous marriage he tried to pawn his, uh, his victoria cross out of frustration really uh, and was found it was actually illegal to do so so although a victoria cross is a wonderful collect item it doesn't carry a monetary value uh, you don't get a monetary reward with it I think you do get a extra pension having done you a lot of work on the pension records. That's for sure. I don't know anything about pensions, I'm afraid. So I would I'd be guided by someone who's worked on the pensions. If you get <laughs> if you make it to a pension, you do get a monetary reward there then. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's not a, I don't think there's that I'm not sure about the direct grant, but I do believe that there was extra pension available but we'll certainly look into that one as part of the ongoing investigation into the western front association's pension records mm -hmm. okay let's uh, have a quick do, do you want to have a look at the questions yourself spencer no, or... you, i'm happy for you to sort of be question master and then sort of ping them out because i can't actually call them up uh, so i can't see any on my no, no worries you, you sh if you look at the q a you might be able oh, to see them, but... they're coming up now yeah Okay. <laughs> you, do you want to have a look at them? Or, or okay, so I'll, I'll sort of work through these. So this is from, yeah. This one's from. Uh, um, oh, that's not a, that's not such a, such a question. Um, oh, here we are. It's from Mark. This is actually a, a sort of a question about style. So, do I prefer online audiences or do I prefer in-person audiences? Well, this is a really good question. Um, I like the fact that online, there's more people can, can tune in and I like to think that they, they enjoy it. Um, there's nothing quite beats a live audience because as any sort of speaker will tell you, you can draw energy off an audience and there's a certain thrill to speaking to an audience. Uh, I, I enjoy them both. I think there's, there's benefits to both, but I'll always choose live to, uh, to, to, to online, I'm afraid. Um, a question from Glyn. Uh, how do you think Congreve performed in March 1918 compared to the other corps commanders in Fifth Army? That's a really good question. I don't think he necessarily did any worse or any better. I think he was in a really difficult position. The, the, the issue that really gets Congreve is his use of 16th Division, which, as many of you will know, gets a terrible hammering. Uh, and it eventually disintegrates. Um, when, 
that's not at a fault of 16th division. It's just being hit by overwhelming force. And one of the reasons it gets hit so hard is that Congreve has left it out somewhat on a limb. And some of Congreve's orders in uh, March 1918, particularly his interest in counter-attacking, don't really fit with the, the situation. What I perceive from having researched Congreve in a lot of detail is I think Congreve's so ill in March 1918 and remember that when we're not just talking an asthma attack that's making you cough, he's also getting bronchitis infections, which give him a temperature, making him exhausted and so on. He's getting a lot of what's called phantom pain in his hand, uh, which is probably brought on by stress. He doesn't know this, but he writes in his diary, he gets a lot of pain where his, his hand used to be, a phantom pain. So he's suffering a lot. And the stress of March 1918 adds to it. And I actually think he's giving orders uh, in haste and he's not necessarily really having the time or perhaps even the energy to think about it. So his performance is not particularly impressive. I, I, as, as I said that as a Congreve defender and a, a fan. Uh, but on the other hand, I think it compares probably uh, equivalent to, to the others. And certainly Butler, who, who has a, a rotten time uh, in 1918, it's probably as, as good as anybody's on this, uh, on this particular front. Uh, Michael says, thanks for an interesting talk. Thank you for coming, Michael. Um, Barbara, usual high standard of subject. Thank you very much, Barbara. Always nice to have kind comments. Thank you very much. <laughs> Does Wolverhampton Uni approve of shooting your lecturer with an air rifle? Asked Andrew. Well, I can say absolutely bloody not. And if anybody was to shoot me with an air rifle, I would hope that a century later, some bozo lecturer was not talking about it with a smile on his face. So no, absolutely not. <laughs> um, Richard asks, how is Congreve's relationship and potential influence with his divisional commanders in 13th Corps, which is Maxi and Shear, as both were innovators and renowned trainers? Well, I have written a little bit about this. Uh, I wrote a chapter about Congreve in 13th Corps in the edited book, At All Costs. What's interesting about Congreve, Maxi and Shear is that they're all friends. Now, this is quite rare for a corps to be put together where everybody's friends. Um, Congreve and Maxi had become friends in the pre-war army. They'd, you, they, they'd allied themselves over their shared love of musketry and musketry training. They were both very, very interested in musketry training. They are both also very keen on the four-company system as opposed to the eight-company system. Um, and so Congreve uh, and Maxi were already pre-war friends. Shear and uh, Congreve had served together in 6th Division, where Shear had been Chief of Staff. So they were actually friends, and they got on extremely well, and they trusted each other. And this was very important for 13th Corps, because Congreve was able to let Maxi and Shear get on with it. He created time and space for them to do what they wanted to do, and he knew they would do it well. So it was a really important relationship. It actually led to Congreve making a very impassioned appeal to say... Um, can you work together, uh, sorry, can we keep our course together? Rather than rotating divisions, I think we should keep course together, rather like the Dominion armies did, uh, but that idea was, of course, not accepted. So uh, they got on extremely well, and that, that a, a fortunate coincidence, this wasn't planned in any way, it just they happened to be uh, all put together in 1916. Um, Richard's comments on, uh, unlike Snow and Hunter, Western Horn and Congreve had a good song, if you can have a good song indeed, have a, Congreve uh, went home in August after falling ill, was this his genuine, yet yeah, this was genuine, he asked if it was genuine sickness, yes he had cholera, uh, he contracted it probably from drinking uh, uncleaned water, which of course the main source of cholera, and one of the reasons he drank this unclean water was of course Congreve didn't drink uh, anything but water, water and tea were his main drinks. He did drink uh, a social drinker at dinners and so on, uh, but certainly on campaign, he did not drink much but water. And he liked to drink and, and indeed eat um, similar rations to that, those that his men had had. So he picked up cholera. It was a genuine illness. He was extremely ill, extremely ill. And he was sent home because he needed time to recuperate. So it absolutely it, it was uh, it was not due to grief, although, of course, I'm sure he was grieving at the time, but it was due to his illness. Uh, indeed. <clears throat> um, Mr. Stevens' comments, excellent talk to the Congreve uh, meet Noel Shavastable VC winner. I honestly don't know. Uh, I have no idea whether they did or not. So I'm, uh, I'm afraid I'll have to pass that one on to, to greater minds than me. Uh, Edward comments about uh, the family from Stafford and that some of the family archives are there in the William Salt Library. Is that the main source of information about Walter and Billy? Uh, yes and no. Uh, Billy's war diary has been republished. It's by, um, the title has Armageddon Road, uh, edited by Terry Norman. His diary is actually in the Imperial War Museum. Walter's diary and uh, indeed most of his letters are scattered 
uh, between the Congreve uh, sort of household, uh, William, the William Salt Library, and the Hampshire County Records Library. Uh, why Hampshire? It's the home of Winchester, the home of the rifles. And for various reasons, lots and lots of Congreve's papers ended up in Hampshire County Council uh, records, uh, where not many people go and visit them. Um, but that's where a lot of Walter's papers are. Indeed, I said the bulk of Walter's papers, including most of his letters and his diaries, are actually in um, Hampshire. Um, Billy's grave is in Corbyn Mil British Military Cemetery and it's offset from the other graves. Are you aware of the reason for this? I get asked this question a lot and the simple answer is I don't know, but I can speculate that this might be Walter offering, uh, using some of his influence here. Because of course he's not buried really anywhere near the point where he's killed. He's buried quite separately from this. And I, sus I, don't, I don't have any evidence to prove this. And I don't really know why he's buried that way, but my inclination is that Walters used his influence, used his pull to have the, uh, Billy's grave put in a more, um, and it's a striking position, those of you who've been there will recognise it. Uh, it's put in a striking position, that's Walters' influence. He's, he's using his influence to make sure that Billy has a, a particularly striking grave here. That's my, I can only assume that, but I don't actually know, I don't have a presence for that. Was the presence of a corps commander welcome to the front line? You know, the long avid street driver coming to the front line. Great question. Um, Congreve thought that he, he, he was, he was, it was great for him to visit. And certainly the soldiers tended to react quite well to Congreve. They liked seeing him, particularly in 1915 and 16 when um, uh, he's a divisional commander, or in 15 when he's a divisional commander, but also in 16, there's, he gets good reactions from the men. And I think he gets along, it works very well for him at the Somme where he knows Maxi and Sheer, the divisional commanders. They know he's not going to be difficult or awkward. There's a friendliness, there's an ease with it. Uh, but you're, it's a very good question because by 1917, when his divisions have changed, his visits to the front line aren't so popular. And they start to become not so popular with some of the men. And the reason for that is, oh, the, uh, the general's coming down to visit the trench. You men, you better make this trench look tidy. And so people are being dragged out and made to do lots and lots of extra work, and it can become quite frustrating for them. Um, his visits to the front, front line, I would say, are not to sort of dictate things. Um, he's not like Goff, who turns up at the front line and starts shouting at people and then pushing people around. Uh, Congreve just likes to go and see. He likes to talk to the soldiers. He's got a common touch, he likes to sort of find out what's going on and so on. So it's more sort of fact-finding missions than anything else. Uh, but by 17 and 18, he's not so popular. By 18, he can't really do it either. He's held so poor by now that sending out to the front line, particularly in uh, February, March, it's very cold. It's not good for his lungs. So he stops doing it. But um, he's, that, that, uh, those visits to the front line become less and less popular, I think, as the war goes on. Does your role as artillery historian cover the Canadians as well? Um, only in the sense that they interact with the Royal Artillery. So if you're going to ask me a question about Canadian artillery, I'm afraid I know very little other than that it existed. So I'm a, uh, I, I, I'd knock that one into the long grass. Uh, James asks, could you say a bit more about the various sources you've used, various family papers and so on, uniformation records? Yeah, absolutely. Um, primary sources for my work on the Congreves are <clears throat> Walter's private papers. As I've mentioned, a lot of them in Hampshire a County Council, others in the William Salt Library. Um, there's also good paperwork for the um, formations he commanded, and that includes right from 18th Brigade up to... Um, 13th Corps and so on. There's also really good paperwork for Walter Congreve um, in the Boer War in his own papers, largely in Hampshire Record Office. There's also really good stuff in the, we are, um, the Rifles Museum in Winchester. They've got a lot of Congreve uh, material, ephemera really, but, but lots and lots of interesting things. Congreve also interacted with lots of, of important contemporaries. So, for example, you can uh, find his letters to Maxey that he wrote uh, in the pre-war era, and you find his letters to Rawlinson. He, he and Rawlinson had a lively correspondence, and he also had a correspondence with Henry Wilson. In fact, a story I could have mentioned, I didn't. Henry Wilson nicknamed Congreve Squibs after the rockets of his ancestors. So there's a wide range of sources being used there. Um, the, my main sources are Walter's private papers and Billy's private papers. Billy's in the Imperial War Museum, Walter's, largely in Hampshire County Council Record Office. Um, Andrew asks, did Rawlinson give Congreve Senior a break after the 1st of July? Was he any keen to fight his corner for 14th of July? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, shall we say that the, uh, uh, the, an epiphany occurs in Rawlinson? Rawlinson had been really quite difficult with Congreve. 1st of July goes off. It's a great success. Haig decides to rotate the axis of the offensive away from Tietfal into the southern sector. And of course, Raw, uh, Congreve is in the box seat. And Congreve 
where he's assaulted on the 14th of July is almost exactly the type of assault that he was trying to have launched for the 1st of July, when Rawlinson was telling him he was too, uh, he was being too cautious. And he, the 14th of July is only possible because Rawlinson has seen the light with Congreve as a to the 1st of July. And there's a wonderful correspondence between Rawlinson and Wilson, two tricky characters in the First World War, where um, Wilson writes, and it, uh, it's between the lines, I don't have it in front of me, but it's between the lines saying, oh, the script has come, has come through for you. And Rawlinson uh, writes this sort of very g- gentle reply, but he's effectively saying, you know, I don't like him, but yes, he's doing very well. So yes, he does see the light. He does see the light. Incidentally, Conley doesn't dislike Rawlinson. There's no evidence that, that he dislikes him. He doesn't necessarily respect him professionally, but there's no personal animosity there. <clears throat> um, but any uh, siblings uh, to, uh, to Billy that equally distinguish themselves? Yeah, the Conley's gone on and fight in the, uh, the Second World War. And indeed, um, I can't off the top of my head and don't have it in front of me. Uh, what happens to them, but at least one Congreve, uh, I think two Congreves are actually killed in the Second World War, and one of them is killed on, on a commando raid, uh, which gives you an idea they're still very brave, still very, uh, still, still fairly intense, still intensely fighting. Just a, a point just to do with siblings and children, um, and I could have put this picture up, but the Congreves are very famous in Britain in, uh, in this period, and when Billy's daughter was born, uh, but Mary uh, to uh, his wife Pamela that was featured on the cover of Tatler magazine so called very very fashionable where they featured uh, a photo shoot with Billy's uh, widow and their daughter just as a side note Walter was um, in his diary he's, he's quite sad that it's a daughter not a son uh, because of course it means that Billy's um, family name is going to is going to disappear <clears throat> Uh, Richard, uh, given that Rawlinson was himself an advocate and exponent of limited buy and hold actions and was viewed by, by Haig as being ambitious, how did Congreve ever t- manage to be seen by Rawlinson as too cautious? Now, this is some, it's a great question. So why was Rawlinson seen as too cautious on the 1st of July? The answer is, I can't be sure why. And this is because the original draft plans for the 13th, 13th Court, as far as I can tell, do no, no longer exist. Uh, the original draft that was submitted to Rawlinson seems to have gone. There's some letters between Maxi and Congreve about it, but we don't exactly know what it was. What we do know is that the plan that was introduced on the 1st of July was, was pr- actually quite close to this. And we know this because Maxi says so. So there's no reason for him necessarily to lie. He says, says it uh, you know, some months later, in fact. My feeling about this, uh, and it is very odd given that Rawlinson is the original bite and hold man and so on, is that Rawlinson doesn't like Congreve anyway. That there's, for reasons I can't quite work out, Rawlinson dislikes him on a personal level. Possibly because Congreve speaks his mind and doesn't necessarily like the man they call the fox. And Ra- uh, Congre- uh, Rawlinson doesn't really want Congreve as a corps commander. He's sort of lumbered with him. He, he doesn't really want him. And he, I think he's actually manoeuvring in the run-up to try and get rid of Congreve and replace him with somebody else. But of course, he has the rug pulled under him because Congreve just goes straight to Hague and says, and Congreve's got a lot of pull, BC holder and so on. Uh, there's no way Rawlinson can get rid of him. So I don't really know. My, my suspicion is it's a personal problem rather than any kind of military problem. Uh, and that, the, my evidence for that is that Maxi says later um, the plan was largely as, it, as our first draft. Uh, I've lost my mouse cursor for a second there. Uh, Billy's medal was served for a series of strong leadership displays and fire rather than a single valorous event. Comment, please, from Bill. Um, it's quite interesting because I think we tend to think of um, VCs nowadays as being for a single dramatic action, whether it's you know, Johnson by Harry thundering into action in APC or H. Jones and the Falklands charging and so on. Um, VCs for multiple actions were not all that uncommon uh, up until this point. So, for example, I talked about earlier father-son VCs. Um, both Goff Senior and Robert Senior had actually won their VCs for multiple um, acts of bravery. Another officer of the First World War VC winner, I've got great admiration for, Charles Fitzclarence VC. He won his uh, VC in the Boer War. Uh, he won it again for several incidents of valorous action. So it was not so uncommon. What's unusual about Billy's is that he's given a VC for a period of action rather than several incidents within that. So that is quite unusual, uh, but I think it's reflective of the fact that he was seen as being so valorous in this period, it would be uh, impossible or unwise to simply pick one out. So in that sense, it's, um, 
uh, it's out there, it's it, it's it's unusual in some ways, but it's also heir to a longer tradition. Uh, someone called Welcome, uh, welcome, uh, welcome indeed. Are you aware why the first v VC recommendation was not followed through? Uh, I'm not aware of the specifics of why it was rejected, but the um, the decisions made for VCs were pretty strict. And anybody who sort of really looked into, I'm sure many of you have, if you look into why and where VCs are awarded, um, sometimes you can find incredible actions and think, well, how on earth did this not win a VC? And other actions, which I'm not saying are not valorous, uh, certainly valorous, but you do sometimes, we can become a bit new to it and just almost see it as run of the mill. Um, so look at the number of VCs that have won for rescuing officers under fire, wounded officers, and one can be a bit blasé, which is a terrible thing to do, I should say, um, you know, sitting at home comfortably. So I don't specifically know why um, he's, he didn't win the VC at Centre El Wa. Um, there's no paperwork I've seen, at least, to explain it. It may simply be that the, um, the decision-making committee decided that it was, it was certainly worthy and it was certainly um, award-worthy, but it was not quite Victoria Cross-worthy. Uh, Simon, are you not being unfair of Congreve as a commander by claiming 13th Corps is a dysfunctional HQ? Is it the role of the Chief of Staff to manage the data activities within the HQ? Do you know who Congreve's Chief of Staff was? In 1916, off the top of my head, I don't, although I've looked at his papers and I should really remember this, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to plead ignorance on this. It is indeed the, uh, uh, the role of the Chief of Staff to maintain staff relations, but it's interesting that everybody blames Congreve for his inability to manage staff. Now, as you say, that's not strictly the role that uh, a corps commander should have, but it is felt that by the, he's, he's often absenting himself from core HQ, and he's often in the trenches, he's not providing enough oversight and guidance. But I do think that is a fair comment, Simon, that perhaps I am a little bit unfair on Congre. I was only relating what his contemporaries criticized him for. Um, but that is a very valid point. And Gordon asks, did Haig often refuse to meet Corps commanders? Um, I can't really give you a, a full answer to that because I haven't really studied that particular question. Um, what I will say is that if Haig liked you on a personal or perhaps professional level, he would go to considerable lengths to meet you and protect your, your career, even if things weren't going terribly well. He had a, more influence in terms of uh, saving people who are in trouble uh, than we might expect. His refusal twice to meet Congreve, um, I think he's unusual. In May 1918, he's got the excuse that there's a tremendous battle going on and so on and so forth, uh, and Congreve going home. Um, in, we, Congreve's request to meet him in April 1916, and Congreve offers to travel to him, is, is more unusual. Um, again, Haig pleads busyness, and he sends a, a staff officer to go meet Congreve and sort out. I don't know whether this is indicative of, of Haig's general refusal to, to meet uh, officers, I suspect there is, uh, in Haig's defence, lots of people, if he, if he met everybody, lots of people would want to meet him and he would be distracted. But Congreve asking twice for a meeting and being refused both times certainly offended Congreve and he remembered it for the rest of his life. And that completes our questions. If I, if I haven't answered your question um, or so, please do ping me a line on Twitter. Uh, and I'll do my best to answer it in 240 characters or less. <laughs> It's been, so thanks very much indeed for a really enlightening lecture. It's only been the third one that we've done and it's gone stormingly. So uh, I'm sure everybody, um, once again, if you'd like to uh, raise your hands uh, on, on the system as, as a show of, uh, uh, as, as a pretend clap, if you like, and that's going through the roof. So lots of hands being raised there. Um, so in conclusion, Spencer, Many thanks indeed for, for taking the trouble to, to talk to the WFA members about this. If anybody's watching this who isn't a, West, a member of Western Fruit Association, please do join us. We're going to do a lot more of these, and I hope that, that everybody's uh, enjoyed it tonight. But uh, I, I, in conclusion, I'll just say thanks very much indeed, Spencer. Thank you, David, and uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye now. Goodbye now. Mademoiselle from Armitage, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armitage, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armitage, she hasn't been kissed for 40 years. Hinky pinky, parlez-vous. Out of kicking Armitage.